Welcome to Investing Insights, partnered by Right Property Group. This is your host, Phil Tarrant. G'day, everyone. Thanks for joining us, Investing Insights. I really enjoy this podcast. We do it every single month uh, in partnership with our good friends at the Right Property Group, uh, Steve Waters and Victor Kumar. Uh, we're now in our second series of this, so obviously it's working, and uh, uh, we do appreciate the feedback that's been coming through. Uh, very different to the Smart Property Investment Show, if that's uh, how you found us right now. Smart Property Investment is really talking with investors about how they're going about doing stuff. The Investing Insights podcast we do with the Right Property Group allows us to deep dive into a lot of the complexities of property investment that we typically don't touch but, you know, I'm not qualified to do it myself and I have some very good co-hosts in terms of Stephen Victor uh, who live and breathe property uh, as property strategists through the Right Property Group. And today in the studio, I only have one of them, uh, Steve Waters. Uh, Victor, from what I understand, is swanning around in sunny Fiji. Living the life. Living the life. Probably drinking some kava. He loves it. No comment. No comment at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how long is he over there for? Just the week, I believe. He's okay. uh, he's back on Mondays over there for a family wedding. Okay, well, there you go. Oh, well, yeah, we miss you, Victor. It's uh, it's not going to be uh, the same without you and uh, your your views and observations, interpretation of all the crazy stuff going on with the property markets uh, is something that I lean on myself. So um, uh, we'll get you back in the studio for, for next month. But today, mate, it's just me and you. Just me and you. What do you reckon? How's things? What's going on in the world of property at the moment? There's a lot of changes, which we expected, but I think there's also a, a lot of... Uh, negative media uh, around at the moment. You would have been living under a rock if you haven't seen it. Mm. Uh, and I think that um, you know, that's starting to perpetuate the market in a different direction. Uh, but I, you know, for me, I think it's just normality. I think more to the point we're coming back to normality mm. uh, as opposed to the great you know, bull run that we've had, especially in the Melbourne and Sydney markets. Yeah. So last time we got together, Steve, um, and go and check it out, 22nd of June was the uh, the last instalment of Investing Insights <coughs> with the Right Property Group. And what we did, we went through, by memory, a whole bunch of different investment strategies and, and, and what actually works. And our conclusion was that there's lots of good strategies out there. The fact is that you need to select the strategy that's right with you, that's going to help you achieve your property investment goals now and into the future. I follow a particular strategy, you follow a particular strategy. Our strategies aren't that dissimilar and it works for us. Uh, the strategies that we pursue in terms of buying under market value properties in affordable areas with high propensity or indicators for growth, which are as cheap as possible to hold, that's a strategy when you look at this current market, which hold, should hold us in pretty good stead because the top end of town, your sort of, let's call them blue chip properties, million dollars plus that investors are investing in, it's quite hard to get financing on these things right now. So, you know, I think the the, the price pressure and also the pressure around yields at the sort of more affordable belt will probably carry us a little bit better during this, let's call it a softening of the market i'm not going to call it a property downturn because um you know the only place where it really properties are going down in value is sydney and in melbourne right there's other parts, parts of melbourne Australia yeah and parts of melbourne so i want to big it up and to your point be careful where you get your media from be careful where you get your information from when you're making property investment decisions because um the media is notorious for sensationalizing stuff so people want to read it and they want people to read read their stories or buy their newspapers so i think it's a um i think you make a really really good point and that there is probably hundreds of strategies out there mm. uh, that work and you know, there's probably an equal amount that don't. And we have very similar strategies, but the reason we use our strategy is because of this very moment in time. It's And once again, it's not the only strategy, but it allows us to sleep at night, as we often talk about. Yeah. Uh, and as we've often talked about as well, you shouldn't be judging a, a property and its and its worth and its potential in a good market like we've just experienced, but mm. how it's going to perform to you or for you in a – not so good market, so a bad market because that's when the rubber hits the road. That's yeah. when your capacity to be able to control and keep the property is paramount. That's survive or not. It is. And so as a property strategist, and I think we're fortunate in Australia that um, the buyer's advocacy, buyer's agency, property strategist industry is, is growing quite considerably. So more and more Australians are turning to professionals like yourself to secure investment property or, or even own occupied stuff. You guys don't do you don't do own occupied stuff, right? You're no. primarily just property yeah. investors. But a lot of people use property buyers for that as well. So I think we're fortunate that we 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 have this emerging industry and people are being a lot more astute in how they're purchasing property. Like, you know, 
how many people go out and make their own um, investment decisions around stocks or, or other asset classes um, versus property? I say, you know, a lot more people secure advice on the other stuff rather than property. So we're seeing a lot more of Australians going down this path, and I think that's very good, and we are a big advocate for it. I think, if I, I think if I go back when I first started, I don't know, what, 15 years, maybe more ago, mm. uh, as a buyer's advocate and strategist, there was literally only oh, maybe five or six of us. There wasn't uh, many, right? Wasn't wasn't many at all. Uh, and if if we fast forward to today, um, you know, there's probably thousands. There, there's a lot, and I'm yeah. trying to get I'm trying to get numbers on it because I, I don't know. I'd like to to help map and benchmark it, but um, my, my view would be not all property strategists or buyers advocates are created equal. Um, but I'm not going to go into that today. What I want to have a chat about is that you know in in the community that we operate within uh, within property and, and and dealing with a lot of property strategists. And talking about strategy and talking about this changing market, a lot of strategists who have traditionally looked to offer advice around securing blue chip properties are having to rethink uh, many ways how they go about delivering these services to their customers because in many cases, their customers can't secure the financing to be investing at that level and having to come down a rung or so to, to look at this sort of four or $500,000 mark. Is that a fair assessment? Is that happening? And, and the reason why they can't get that, that financing because they're getting serviceability assessed at seven plus percent um, and all these other, uh, the rigour of, um, of, of bank policy changes that has changed the way in which they can focus on investing. They might make great income, but they can't afford to buy investment properties at that top end. Is that very is that, true? Is that, is that happening? True. Yeah. yeah. So it's, um, and once again, not belittling you know, any of the other strategies out mm. there, and, and this is just our particular strategy. But what we're starting to see now is exactly what you just talked about, is that perhaps some of the strategies that are around that high-priced property with a much lower, let's call it a 3% or thereabouts 4% yield, combined with the fact that if they've owned them for five years and they're rolling off interest only into a P&I rate and they can't go elsewhere, so they're going to just have to wear that, yeah. that's having a massive effect uh, on the household budget. And even if they're in a position where they want to buy again, uh, or if they're a first-time buyer looking for the higher-valued asset, the banks, as you say, they're, they're just so tight now, and, and rightly so with whatever the price asset is. Yeah. Uh, but what we're seeing now is that some of those strategists are having to perhaps... Rethink a bit. Rethink a lot and come into perhaps some of the more affordable corridors. And to only yesterday I was in uh, Brisbane for a couple of days and uh, going around with some of our buyers agents just for some ongoing training and what have you. And for me also to keep my finger on the pulse on the street. The ground truth. The ground truth, as we often talk about. Uh, and we were having a, a speak to, I was having a chat with one of the agents up there as we were going through a few of the properties. And he was saying that uh, there's a few other buyers agents that were also interested in this particular property. In fact, one of them had made an offer. And the company that was there making that other offer all before us was a company that was usually plays in that sort of 700 to a million dollar bracket. Yeah. They're clearly having problems sourcing the finance for that top end price bracket, so they're having to come down into that lower price bracket. Mm. And when I say lower, no, without any. And I want to give some context on that because we're talking about affordable areas. It sounds like it's I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this podcast. Like the shit properties, they're not right. We're, we're talking. If no, you're talking not. about no. investing in mortgage belts of Sydney and and Melbourne, you know, I think of Sydney for example. A fifth of all Australia lives in the western suburbs, western southwest suburbs of Sydney, right? It's where most of Australia lives, right? So mm. we talk about affordability. No, no, no. That's the normal part of Australia. That's where most people buy their properties. And this is where people, I think, yeah, when we talk about uh, affordable corridors, is people do think that it's perhaps the you know the, the low end of town, yeah, uh, and that there's all sorts of dramas and problems with tenants and mm. and so on, but. Uh, it is it is not the case. And if you look at these affordable corridors, uh, they have the best infrastructure. Yeah. It, uh, and they've had it for a long, long time because that is where the majority of people live. After yeah. all, that's the mortgage belt. It's funny, and, and I think about this a lot, and I'm fortunate I think that I can actually put a foot in both camps of affordable world and uh, the, the not-so-affordable world. Um, you know, I grew up in Blacktown, right? I know the western suburbs of Sydney very well. I delivered pizzas out there for four years, right? I know that part of Australia, I know it well. You have a lot of people that invest in property typically are higher income earners. Uh, and if they're higher income earners, they typically live maybe in the more blue chip parts of Australia. So I live in a blue chip part of Sydney right now. It's a very blue chip part of Sydney, which is cool, right? So I get to see both sides. And, and my peer group who typically are reasonable or high income earners, you know, their, their view of affordable properties 
is really interesting because typically they'd be the people chasing these $700 million stuff, but now they're struggling to actually get the financing that. So they're starting to change their mindset around what is an affordable property and what is a good asset. And a lot of them are thinking about, oh, hang on a second, you know, the suburbs of Brisbane, the suburbs of Melbourne, the suburbs of Sydney, uh, less so Sydney at the moment because I'm, I'm not investing out there. I don't think there's a lot of people out there. But you're seeing this this paradigm mind shift now of, of people are starting to evolve their strategy. And With, it's an interesting, yep. it's a really interesting, I like the psychology of it. I find I, I it really it. entertaining. Yeah, cause we see it every yeah. cycle. And, mm. it, and this is just history repeating itself as we often talk about because let's say those, uh, those higher income earners who traditionally – well, generally speaking, they'll ride that that higher priced property's growth. So, you know, just round figures anyway. Let's call it a million bucks, 800,000, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and clearly 10% growth of 800,000 is better than 10% growth of 350,000 in terms of a dollar figure. Yeah. Uh, but when we throw the what we call the net ability into it, so let's take out all our negative shortfall, let's take out every cost associated with it and let's look at it over not just a – a bull market that let's if we're talking about Sydney that we've had for the last five years or thereabouts, mm. but let's look at that over 15 or 20 years, right down to a granular level, uh, and then throw the un uh, something that you can't measure being a peaceful mind or, or a sleep at night fact, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, we start to see that this time of the cycle that a lot of people start to have that mind shift, and you know, people that want to invest will invest, they'll always look for the opportunity and they're starting to go to these more affordable areas. Now, mm. once again, it's not the only strategy. Uh, it's just a strategy that we've employed and executed around our risk profile. Yeah. So we spoke about these strategies last time we get together, and, and, and nature of this podcast is really just interpreting that in a changing marketplace and, and how opportunities arise for investors in, in evolving marketplaces, whether up or down. And, you know, I was just talking about the, the mindset of an investor to change the way in which they might view different asset classes. I'm talking about property, but asset classes being a, a unit in Bondi versus a, a unit on the train line out in Rouse Hill or you know a house in, 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 in Penrith. So if you have prejudices in that way, I'd, I'd say get rid of them pretty quickly because you're missing out on opportunities, uh, particularly in, in changing markets. Correct. I'll yeah. put this to you, Steve. Um, uh, often uh, on Investing Insights, the right property group, we, we talk about the mistakes that people make in buying the wrong asset and that stops them from investing or building a portfolio in the future. And often that asset might be an off-the-plan apartment that doesn't meet its valuation and you get negative equity and you're hamstrung for five, six years until that thing comes up to where it should be. When you look at that same principle in an evolving finance landscape, so no one knows what's going to happen to mortgages moving forward. Maybe this seven plus percent serviceability uh, metric at PNI, and banks are getting a lot more sophisticated now in, in how they map your your yeah, um, big data. Your, your, your spends, mm. right? So you can't bullshit a loan document anymore because the bank knows exactly where you're spending your money. And, and, and not that and you ever should have. Phil. No, no, not at all. And I never have. No. Uh, you know, my my personal PNL is squeaky clean, but um, it's getting harder. Right. So this is the new norm. This this is the new norm. So people who have traditionally bought their first investment property, which is higher end of town, eight a million plus. And the fact that banks now are so much tighter on serviceability, that might have them priced out of the market for 10 years now. Yeah. So it might be a great asset, but in terms of their ability to keep going on and on, it's not buying a dud off the plan apartment somewhere with negative equity. It's just that they cannot shift their earning capacity into gear to a point or reduce their level of spending to actually show the bank that they are able to service new debt moving forward. So maybe this might be the new... No, I, I only buy one property, you know. Yeah, I look, well, if you're at that higher end of the bracket, for mm. sure. We often talk about I'd rather have, you know, three $300,000 assets than one $900,000 asset because that's my risk profile yeah. and, I, and I love the cash flow. Yeah, the, the, and, and, and by the way, I'm going to preface this by saying I have investments across both ends of town, right? You yeah, know, as do I. And it's not, million plus stuff yeah. and I've got... Three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand dollars stuff, and that's the reason why I'm so. Uh, and I like a diversified portfolio, so it's great. Yeah, and yeah. and I, and I'm the same. But that's the reason, once again, why we're in this. Uh, that strategy is ours, is because I've got it at both ends of town, mm. so to speak. And the whole premise that the lower end properties or the or the more affordable properties give you more heartache and headaches than something that's worth a million bucks. I'm, I, I can stand here and tell you that's just not the case. I have more troubles out of my higher valued assets mm. uh, when I throw everything into the pot, such as cash flow and headaches and you know, repairs and maintenance than I do in my more affordable properties. But that's just me. Maybe I'm just lucky that way. Mm. But I think coming back to your point, I think with the, with the changing in finance environment that we have, perhaps this is the new norm. And to be honest with you, I don't mind it. 
I real I really don't. I think as people, well, with the adventation of big data and the the ability for banks to to check and cross check and share data, it's going to make people be a little bit more financially responsibility and or responsible. Well, people aren't being responsible for themselves, so I think it's a good thing that the banks are yeah. intervening in some ways because. You know, there is a lot of – we talk about media and sensationalist media. You know, there is this view now that every single person can be a property bazillionaire, right? Everyone has the right to own a property, et cetera. So a lot of these norms are changing, right? But still, people are still trying to keep up with the Joneses. And in many ways, that's precipitating a lot of poor financial decisions. So the education is out there. There's no excuse for not being educated in property or, or finance at the moment. Just listen to this show or some of the other very good property podcasts out there. There is so much free information out there right now that hopefully stop you making stupid finance decisions. There That's should my be. view, right? But it's not happening, right? right? So the banks and our government regulators have intervened rightfully to try and curb some of the less than sensible financial decisions that consumers are making. Uh, and big data is supporting this. So it's going to put the brakes on a lot of people, give them greater fiscal responsibility and, and make them more prudential through policy for what they're doing. And they could go further. That, that's good. They could go further. They could go further. And, and once again, I wouldn't mind. But if they were really, really serious about um, you know, being responsible, so to speak, mm. then regulators, you know, regulate the industry. Yeah, that's going to have a, a huge effect. It's not regulated. Property investment is not, not regulated. regulated. No. So, yeah, and you're on you're on the on the board of people with me, and yeah, you know, that's one of the things that we are people always talking for years. Yeah, we regulated. want the industry to be regulated because that will give some sensibility and and perhaps better operators within the within the industry. We want that. Yeah, and I think the issue we have right now is a real climate of distrust in financial institutions and people involved in the financial sector. So mm. we've going through, gone through Royal Commission and a lot of that's been highlighted. A lot of that's been sensationalised as well. It's been very, you know, you can pick the worst out of everything and try and paint a picture that everything is fundamentally stuffed, right? But there is some people who, who are involved in the financial advice sector that don't necessarily always give the best advice for the customer. And there needs to be greater rigour, rules and regulation around policing financial advice and trades, in my view. I agree. And you I don't. think, and I actually think the majority of people would agree with that as well. Yeah. Uh, and if we People want to trust people, right? Fundamentally, people want to trust people. People want to get the advice that's right for them at any given time. Yeah, so it's the bank's turn at mm. the moment to, yeah. you know, to be sort of raked over the coals. But yeah, as a prediction, and I look into the you know, my murky crystal ball, I think as the next two, three years unfold, we're going to see a little bit of distrust within the property industry as well as people... Uh, you know, the values decline dramatically. Mm. Uh, and then when I say dramatically, I don't mean this free-falling brick. I mean that they pay too much to begin with, whether it be yeah. via you know, slick salesmen, shiny brochures and off the plan or, or house and land packages, whatever it may be. So I think you're going to see a lot of hard luck stories uh, over the next few years. But And the people with a vested interest will highlight these stories as the norm. Correct. what will happen. Uh, they will. And it uh, always happens. Well, it does. Yeah, and but, it doesn't but, matter but, the, but, whatever the industry yeah. is, it always happens. Yeah. But once again, and, and I suppose making the point again, regulate the industry and we won't see this again, hopefully, or not as not as bad. Now, I'm not trying to paint this, you know, this, this whole property economy, so to speak, as you know, we're in all sorts of trouble and the market's crashing and, and all that sort of business. But it's just a, it's a bit of a topic at heart because it comes around every single property cycle mm. and um, you know, history repeating itself. But the silver lining uh, for mine is that those that – are prep or have been prepared and if I just you know, really look back at what we've been talking about for the last probably two years a lot is about the finance environment how it will change how people's loans will roll off from you know interest only into p and I and be caught because mm. they can't go anywhere else uh, falling prices in Sydney or consolidating prices in Sydney whatever you want to call it and Melbourne for that matter and not having cash buffers aside to take care of business when you need to, yeah. not having capital buffers uh, to take care of business when you need to, or even to take advantage of an opportunity. Because let me tell you, there will be opportunities from this moment on for the next few years uh, mm. in different markets. and If you're prepared for it. If so, you're prepared. Yeah. So, so, so what we're chatting about here is that it's a market in flux and we're talking primarily Eastern Seaboard, Sydney, Melbourne in particular. Correct. Right? That's, yep. what, that's what you see in the softening. So it's a market in flux. Markets in flux offer opportunities, also offer a lot of threats and risk. And this is the nature of operating in that space. So to be a, a property investor who's looking to capitalise on a changing market, which is this podcast today, you're talking about 
preparation. Preparation being your house is in order, you've got cash buffers, your interest rates are good, you know, you're as you're you're as tight as possible on your current portfolio and have an understanding appreciation of this evolving market and how you spend your money right now has got to influence your ability to get debt in the future. Right. You need you need to be Correct. you need to clean clean your act up. And it's not about, oh yes, Mr. Bank, I want to start borrowing more money. I'll change my ha- spending habits now. They're going to look back retrospectively yeah. and, and, and have a look at you. Um, but it's you, preparation if, as it's well. It's preparation. That's the preparation. 100%. Little things. Get rid of credit card debt. There's no greater return on your investment than clearing debt at 18 to 24%. Yeah. Like it's a great ROI, right? Getting rid of personal loans, you know, car loans. Someone, mm. One of the brokers was telling me the other day that um, like if you've got a $50,000 car loan, it could be gauged as much as you know, $200,000 mortgage debt or $200,000 worth of mortgage yeah. debt. That's so, a so that big hampers hit. serviceability. 100% because you want to be in a position to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves. And let's also be clear that we are only talking about Sydney and Melbourne here. And yes, Perth is continuing on its uh, downward trend for the most, even though it is arresting a little. Mm. Uh, Northern Territory is much of the same. Adelaide, as steady as you go. We talked about Sydney softening, parts of Melbourne softening. Um Brisbane, steady as she goes. So we're not it's not doom and gloom everywhere. And but I think the media's doing a really good job with the levers beating it up. That are yeah, that are being pulled mm. uh, to beat it up. And yeah, we don't mind that to, at the end of the day. So, so so the little things really matter. So you paid your car off in four years' time with no debt on it, don't go out there and get a new one because it's gonna hamper your ability to invest in property. You know, little things like this. Delayed gratification. Delayed how, gratification. how bad do you want it? Yeah. Mm. And if you want to capitalise on market opportunities you need to sacrifice so the people that do well in this particular market cycle are those going to be able to make quick decisions based on uh, the bedrock of confidence around their ability to secure financing and negotiate with it's a biased market we're moving into in, but where? in sydney yeah in sydney, in sydney. yeah yeah and that's and I, th- I think once again that's my point so it's a buyer's market in sydney or it's becoming it's mm. a buyer's market in certain parts of melbourne or it's becoming as i said i was up in brisbane the other the other day and let me tell you it's not a buyer's market in the areas that we are because it's full of buyer's agents or buying property right what's well, for well buyer's agents first home buyers first home home first home buyers those numbers are increasing there's a lot more of them in the market now interstate like migrate Mi- yeah, migrating yeah, into yeah. brisbane because you know it's half the price of the average of sydney at the end of the day and you know it's a very it's a very attractive market from a, a dollars and cents point of view mm. along with the cash flow great lifestyle it happens every cycle so Ignore the media, is what you're saying. I'm not saying ignore the media, and I'm not saying ignore the I'm not data. I'm saying you should read smartproperinvestment.com. They will give you great information every day. <laughs> <laughs> Quick plug. Yeah. <laughs> only, by, only supplied by the, yeah. Yeah, the, the good strategist. The good strategist. Yeah. But I think you know, take the media with a grain of salt. Take the data as exactly that. It's just an indicator, and it's usually a little bit behind the times. Yeah. So, it's rearward looking rather than forward. Well, it is. So it really pays dividends to. You know, I'd love to say surround yourself with subject matter experts like ourselves, but if you're absolutely adamant that you want to do this yourself and there's mm. nothing wrong with that, then you need to invest the time yourself by going to the areas that you want to invest in, walk the streets in a good way, um, speak to the agents and get some truth so around. you've got to do the hard work. You could, well, you have to. You're spending, you know, you're spending half a million bucks. Yeah, you're not, it's hard work. You're not buying a pair of shoes. More people spend time shopping around for the best deal for a hotel on the internet than what they do spending so $500,000 on an investment property. So you true, know, yeah. They it, just- look, but to, you know, to be fair, for me to buy a, a computer, mm. it'll take me three or four months because just the nature of myself. tight I, is the problem. Well, yeah, because I'm tight. <laughs> but I also I, I need to know that, yeah, the, the, the widget that I'm getting is is the right widget. Mm. And property's a little bit different, obviously, because I do it. Every day. Do it every day, but that's my point. Yeah. We do it every day. Mm. And if you want to be serious and you want to have your mitigation in place, then invest the time that you need to to be the investor. So on the research side, um, uh, I can't remember where I, where I saw or heard it, the you know, property data looks backwards about what's happening. That might give you some indications on trends or interpretation of how things might move forward. But I think some of the rating agencies, whether it's Standard or Pause or, or the other guys have – have said this softening of sitting property is not going to be as severe or as prolonged as recent cycles. You know, there's been times in Sydney where prices have fallen over rapidly over a period of time and and bounced back up. But um, the numbers I saw was that it'll be a, a relatively sharp downward cycle in terms of time, not 
price and then by the time it gets down there, it'll pay, take about the same same time to get back up to where it started, you know. So it's not going to be as as significant as previous cycles. But, you know, you've got to get this information. You know, you, you look anywhere and you're going to get – you can disprove or prove a particular point. Whatever you're looking for, you'll find. Mm. It, um, and, I, and I read the same reports and I just think that that any of these uh, forecasters, mm. uh, any of the economists, what have you, are really – just that they're just modeling something on certain trigger points and 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 certain what ifs yeah yeah but nobody knows what's going to happen so i'll guarantee you that all that all that uh, modeling will be out the window if let's just take finance once again because that is the vehicle at the end of the day if they loosen the shackles on finance yeah. or if they tighten the shackles on finance even further all of this modeling will be out the window and it'll, there'll be a new set of Modeling there'll be a there. new new a new new norm a new new norm and I mean look what they've done uh, the other day which is something that we've also said that was going to happen is uh, Westpac pulling out of SMSF lines yeah St George yeah and out. St George yeah. Well, and we've been saying that for strongly for the last twelve months in fact you and I've even had this conversation yeah, we have so yeah well, my broker actually uh, emailed me during the week saying S, uh, St George is pulling out if you're not in by the th- 31st of July or whatever Correct. it was, you're not going to get it. And my, my response to him was, well, I actually got to find a place in an exchange before. And he went, no, they just got to get it in a system. You know, mm. they're going to wind it all up by October. And I went, oh, what about other lenders? What about Macquarie? Because they do SMSF lending. And he went, yeah, they can do it, but they don't have an offset. So, you know, all these little nuances of it all. You know, like, and I sat there and I was actually having a chat with a, a friend of mine who's a property investor last night. And we're looking at the logic of, why they're pulling out of SMSF loans because it's a good earner for them. You know, mm-hmm. interest rates are significantly higher than what they are on owner occupied or investor loans. So, you know, our conclusion was that they probably don't want to get out of it because, you know, it's it's good for business, but they're getting pressure from policymakers around it. And I, and I thought, well, maybe they're getting, you know, there's some good lobbyists in these super, you know, retail funds or, or industry funds who want all that money going into their coffers rather than people managing themselves. That's the, the cynical journal. I was about to say, here's the doomsday at, you know, prepper. Yeah, it, you know, but like, yeah, why are they getting out of the lending? You know, oh, it's, look, it's I think, a, yeah, as I said, for 12 months we've been saying SMSF lending as we know it mm. will, you know, will not exist uh, in, the, in the near future and, and that's what's happened. But I think it's more along the lines of, uh, when they collate all the information and they see the the debt to household income ratios and bits and pieces, and they've hit a bit of a panic button. Yeah, and here's another way to deleverage, I suppose. Oh, look, it's bank policy. You know, there'd be good rationale for it, but uh, I want to try and get the bottom of it. We might bring some people in and ask them those questions, but you know, it'd be good. But where does it take us to from here? And, and yeah. once again, I, I I just urge people or, or the listeners to really look at the the market in its entirety. We're talking about Sydney in terms of negative media. We're talking about Melbourne in terms of negative media. Let's mm. not forget that interest rates and the cost of money is ever so cheap. Yeah, like it is as cheap as we've ever seen. It's a great environment to be in. It's a uh, fantastic environment, and we're just going back to normality. Mm. Yeah, you know, those that can uh, obtain finance at this point in time deserve to obtain finance at this point in time under the new um, let's call it calculations. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got no problem them measuring serviceability at some. 7.5% percent p I think it's good investors. It's it pretty good that, mitigation. You know, great mitigation. Yeah. Great mitigation, you know, and, and knocking out 103% loans, you know, like, come on, you know, if you're taking on that sort of debt, you're a bit mad, right? Even at 90%, you know, if you can get it in the 80s, um, you know, I wouldn't be taking 90% mortgages in a, in a market in a, in, a, in a market in flux. You know, it's no. a it's a quick way to get in a negative equity. And if you get that phone call saying, uh, you know, Mr. Tarrant, you you got to, you know, pay all this debt off. We don't want to hold this property no more because it's going up in value. You know, that's when you find yourself a spot of bother. Well, on that, like, I don't know of, I think I know of one person in 20 years of doing this. I know mm. one person in residential uh, environment that has been called in because of their equity position. Yeah. But I know plenty that have been called in because of their cash flow position. Absolutely. And and, and this, for me, once again, this market that, that we're in offers opportunity. Now, yeah, that, I can understand that there might be some people out there listening saying, yeah, that's great. You know, I understand you saying that because you're in the industry. Mm. Uh, but it's actually what I believe. Yeah. And that's where my money is. I'm still buying today. I signed yeah. contracts the other day on another property. Cool. I truly do believe what I am talking about. And mm. I think you'll find most of the advisors out there that have seen multiple property cycles, and this is the key, multiple property cycles, would agree with me in saying that, you yeah, know, it's not as bad as what it's made out to yeah. be yeah. and those advisors those strategists that perhaps have seen nothing but 
the last five years. Happy days in Sydney. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where they yeah. are. And, and this truly is a cash flow thing as well because, you know, to get called out on negative equity in a property, there's a lot of factors going to indicate that, um, you know, whether it's an off the plan apartment coming to um, settlement is a very different... That's, that's a, a different that, kettle that, of fish, That's yeah. a point in time. But, you know, to actually prove negative equity in a, uh, a property is it's a lot of factors. But cash flow, you know, cash flow is immediate and a bank will call you out pretty quickly if they go, you've missed an interest repayment. They'll call you out within 30 days. Absolutely. Yeah. You've missed two interest payments, you've missed three interest payments, you're in trouble. Then they'll look further. Yeah. Then they'll send valuers out and then it's a whole different kettle of fish in terms yeah. of the equity position. So which is why we are constantly reviewing clients' portfolios to make – and you know, yours included – to mm. make sure that the cash flow is where it is, um, that you're on top of your business yeah. and that you can take advantage of opportunities or consolidate. Yeah. Sometimes consolidating and not buying anything is where you'll make your most money. Yeah, yeah and I've got no problem with that. So uh, you know, if you don't have sophistication to make these decisions yourself or, or you need some advice and guidance, be careful where you get your information from in property investment. Um, fortunate there's – it's a good podcast around like this, but um, yeah, don't be listening to Uncle Uncle Benny at, at a family barbecue who's never invested in property before. <laughs> Uncle Benny, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't um and 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 be 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 conscious about where you're getting your advice from, um, and whether or not there's any agenda behind that advice. So uh, that's my two cents around this. But lean on people to help you make the right decisions. Steve, I think we've done pretty well out of this. You I know, think so. Changing market, market in flux. Get your house in order. Look for opportunities. Open. Take the blinkers off. Um, maybe emotionally, or or uh, you know, if you've got any perceived prejudices around the type of areas or properties you don't want to be buying, you know, you're probably missing out on opportunities. I think we cover that quite well. Any other summation? Oh, like I think if you if you're yourself in a state of flux and you're unsure, you know, reach out to the experts to mm. perhaps cast an eye over your position. Yeah, uh, is a really good start and. I think that you'll find the good experts, if they think that you're not in a position, they'll tell you so. Yeah. Rather than, oh, hey, you're in, you're in a great position. You and you, see, you, you want bad, negative news from your uh, your strategist, your advisors, rather than always good stuff. You know, you don't want to pat on the back all the time and go, you're doing well, you're doing well. You want them to challenge you. All the time. You know, you want to be challenged. That's what you're paying for. Uh, and and a, good, a good strategist, a good accountant, a good broker will challenge you. They'll challenge your assumptions. They'll challenge your opinions. And that's what a good one will be doing. But anyway, um, uh, normally I'd lean on Victor on this, but I'm going to have to come to you. If people want any information around Right Property Group, what do they do? Or they want questions around the, the podcast. I can't uh, remember what the email address was. Is it questions? It's a trick question, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, no. questions. It's uh, questions at, at rightpropertygroup.com.au or come to us via the you know, multitude of different A social, Facebook page yeah, social platforms uh, or jump on the website yeah. at the end of the day. And we hold... Uh, open forums in Sydney on I think it's roughly the first Tuesday of every month have done for about nine years now yep. uh, and I think it's the last Tuesday or thereabouts of every month in Melbourne Okay, where we just get uh, we open up to the floor and we have a, a, a subject uh, and we talk about that or we have some guest speakers and we mm. sort of turn everything up on its upside down That's on cool. its head and I've been a couple of these myself and um, they're very similar to this podcast right just people talking property you know yeah. it's an open forum you know yeah, very much. get a lot of info out of it and what, what do I um what I find interesting when I uh, come to yours, which is probably a bit too infrequent, so I make a bit more of an effort. But uh, <laughs> you, you got you got punters in there, and that, that's a term of endearment of like you know have been to your forums for maybe four years and never bought something, but they go every single week. But then you got people with portfolios fifty, and they're still going along, and they get a lot of value out of it. So it, it really intrigues me. We we the, like the it. diversity. Yeah, we like it because even if someone comes for four years and you know, doesn't utilize our services, we're we we're, we're cool with that. We yeah. we we don't mind. Yeah, you know, as long as we can, yeah, you know, perhaps educate and. You know, everyone uses that word, I suppose, but if, if we can inform, open people's right? eyes and yeah. inform, it's a chance for people to network with people that are thinking about starting or that have got the 50 or whatever it may be. So it's a mm. great learning platform as well uh, off the stage. But, you know, it's not a – we call it a safe space. There's no selling from anyone. Uh, and if we, you know, if we find anyone sort of swapping business cards and trying to sell, Stuff. I don't know, Amway or, or Nutramedics <laughs> or off the plan, you know, we, they're out. Mm. So the the uh, nothing my, against Amway on no no, no, no just Amway's saying. great. Um, uh, to my point around, there's no there's no excuse not to be educated in property investment. So if you want to do the hard work and you want to be successful, you got to do this sort of stuff. Anyway, uh, thanks, Steve. Really enjoyed it. Victor, shout out. We'll see you back next time. Um, and uh, I'm going to challenge Victor to come along with a really good topic. You know, I like the idea that uh, we're very fluid in the way we set the agenda for these particular podcasts. So we're right on mark in terms of what's happening current with the status here and now. So uh, Victor, come together with a really good topic and uh, I'm sure we'll have a good chat. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye.